told us we brought you the head of the wicked witch of the west we, we remelted her with with extensive brexit negotiations you liquidated her eh very resourceful i'll have to give the matter a little thought go away and come back tomorrow tomorrow oh but i want to go home now yeah but you had plenty of time already yeah Great and powerful Oz. I said come back tomorrow. If you were really great and powerful, you'd dismantle capital. Patriarchy <laughs> and stick to the scraps. Oh, sorry, thanks. If you were really great and powerful, you would keep your promises. Do you presume to criticize the great Oz, you ungrateful creatures? Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Pay no attention to that man. Behind the curtain. Hi everyone. Today I'd like to talk about power. Now, most of the time when people talk about power, there's a certain shorthand we use. We often speak of power as embodied by people a mysterious they, and ascribe responsibility for acts of power to these various agents. Or we think of various individual politicians, business people, or other such individuals as responsible for the problems we now have. Now I'm not saying this is entirely wrong, but I also do not think that this is the whole story where power is concerned. So I want to explore some of the ideas we may have about power if we go a bit further down its yellow brick road, pull back the curtain, and look beyond this shorthand. Part 1. Do you have the power? Now I'm not criticising people for using this shorthand to discuss power, or suggesting that it is wrong to use it even if you are aware of the arguments I'm about to give, as many people certainly are. And it's a shorthand I myself still use, partially because it's convenient and partially because it does describe a very important view of power that which responds to agents enacting power. And even I, making this video, don't intend to stop using this phrasing when it is relevant, unless of course I'm directly addressing a topic, like here, which makes it more useful to go to this level of detail in describing power. This isn't an argument about smugly correcting people's language, but about understanding some of the underlying forces behind that language more deeply, so as to better address the problems of power relations in our society. However, the fact that this phrasing is common is all the more reason, in my view, to provide this sort of context. So what then is wrong with these statements? Well, they're not wrong, but there is an oversimplification here. We describe power as embodied in people, in agents. We think of power as something someone does, and I'm not saying this isn't useful. The power relations we live under do regularly create a space for people to make decisions which adversely affect others. Power can be enacted by agents, and it is certainly possible and important to criticise people in positions of power for their behaviour. However, if we only think of power in this way, then we ignore another dimension of power that is also very important. This is not just a matter of accuracy though. As I will examine later, an understanding of power beyond simply the repressive or oppressive tactics of individuals based on free will allows us to diagnose certain serious problems with our society, in its structure, functioning and trajectory and highlights how these dangers are not just the product of corrupt individuals, but in our institutions, in our ideas, and in the very foundations of the way we think about the world. We are used to thinking of power as we see it in the Emerald City throne room in The Wizard of Oz, a huge display of lights, but one which distracts us from the secret agents of power, the men behind the curtain, who it implores us not to look at. But this image, I contend, may be leading us down a wrong turn on its yellow brick road. Why is this important? 
Well, power has generalized effects across the population. We all suffer from, say, a certain sort of labor relations that became prominent in the 18th century by which we sell our labor for piecemeal wages to property owners who profit from it, i.e. capitalism. Now when we see this generalized effect, it's easy, through this shorthand, to think about this power as being enacted by individual capitalists who own the industries, and in one sense, it is. These people are often making purposeful decisions that disadvantage their workers in many cases. But then, some bosses are nice, in person. Some people may even, in rare cases, work for bosses who really care about their well-being, may even sympathize with your politics. But they still enact these capitalist labor relations. This is often an argument leveled against notions of the bourgeois and proletariat, or working class and ruling class, when opposing the standard Marxist discourse. People often use these terms as referring to rich and poor people, which leads them to make arguments like this or that person is nice, but they're technically bourgeois, or such and such person is working class, but deeply supports capitalism, or something on these lines. Of course, this is a misunderstanding. As Marx well understands, these classes are positions based on the material relationship of people to the system. The bourgeois don't oppress the poor because they are cruel and heartless monsters, no more than the proletariat are defined through their mutual, well-reasoned understanding of Marx. What Marx is documenting, something recognized by many before and since, not least Adam Smith, is that the positions of people relative to the economy, or means of production, incentivize them to behave in certain ways regardless of their character. In essence, these positions are not produced by personal choices to enact power in a certain way, but by the structure of the system itself, by capitalism. We can see this at work in the simple example of a publicly listed corporation, that is, a company that's floated on the stock market. In a purely agent-based view of power, the CEO is the head of the company and can enact what policies they like within the regulatory framework of the state. However, the system they are working in demands that they produce quarterly growth for shareholders, and that this growth should be at least of a stable proportion, if not increasing. No job, in my experience with Goodyear, has been as frustrating as the CEO job. Because even though the perception is that you have absolute power to do whatever you want, the reality is you don't have that power. Now the stockholders exert this pressure, but even they are not the ones creating it in terms of their own acts of moral agency. Most investors are not directly engaged with the company or the discussions around it and work through brokers simply looking to maximize their profit by maximizing the return. And regardless, the implicit intent behind the buying of stocks as a social institution is for the value to grow. So this imperative acts not at the level of the individual, but of the system in which they are placed. The power is encoded in the social structure, not in the will of the individuals who take their positions within that structure. This results, regardless of their view, in the CEO being bound to increase the returns regardless of the cost, be it that they are unable to do the expensive research and development for a long-term goal, or that they can't afford to pay their workers as much. Of course, profits in the first place are, as Marx points out, based on extracting part of the value of the work done by the workers, often a very large part. I go into this in detail in part two of my Dark Side of Liberalism series. So the class relations emerge from this extraction or exploitation of the workers' labor value. So it doesn't matter what the CEO thinks of this, they may be a Marxist and object to this relation, but by being CEO of a publicly listed company, they are bound by a system to the investors' profits. If they tried to make their company give a significantly fairer remuneration to the workers, this would undermine the short-term returns to shareholders, and, regardless of their goodwill, they would likely be fired and replaced with someone willing to do the job as the system requires. There is a great example of this in the film The Corporation, where we see climate protesters set up a picket outside the house of the CEO of Shell Oil in order to protest the fossil fuel company's contribution to climate change. The CEO came out and drank tea with the protesters with his wife, agreeing with many of their points, but explaining if he acted to reduce Shell's production of fossil fuels, he would just be fired by the board. My wife and I, some years ago, had a, at our home a demonstration. 25 people arrived, they hung a big banner on the top of our house saying murderers, they danced around outside and gas masks and so on. But then we sat down and talked to them 
for a couple of hours and uh, you know we gave them tea and coffee and they had lunch on our lawn. Well, there's another coffee coming. There's, there's no. Who wanted? I'm sorry about the soya. Anyway. I've not <laughs> no need for you to be deceitful. Why didn't you just ask me whether I was in? Look at me hanging murderous. After about 20 minutes, they said. Well, the problem's not you, you know, it's Shell. So I said, no, wait a minute, let's uh, talk about what is Shell. You know, it's made up of people like me. In the end, what we found in that discussion was all the things that they were worried about, I was worried about as well. Climate, you know, oppressive regimes, human rights. So people in these supposed positions of power do not even have the agency to turn around and act to prevent existential threats to the species. Uh, you want to distinguish between the institution and the individual. So uh, slavery, for example, or other forms of tyranny are inherently monstrous. But the individuals participating in them may be the nicest guys you can imagine. Benevolent, uh, friendly, nice to their children, even nice to their slaves, uh, caring about uh, other people. I mean, as individuals, they may be any. Uh, the, as in, in their institutional role, they're monsters because the institution's monstrous. And of course, this is true of politicians too where financial backing for candidates and parties and the high power of capitalist forces in much of the world's economy tie the hands of even those we think of as having most power, so that all our national and international responses to climate change are doomed to inadequacy. Which, incidentally, is why we must stop capitalism in order to stop climate change. But that's another story. Using the structural view of power, we can also understand better a slogan like the commonly repeated All Cops Are Bastards, or ACAB. This slogan is often counted at the level of the goodness, or not, of individuals in the police, saying that this or that cop is a nice person, as though one good apple disproves the theory. And, you know, I've met in my life off-duty police who seem perfectly nice in person, but the slogan refers not to the content of their character, but to the structural role they play in society. What they think of capitalism, for example, is irrelevant. Their job is to protect its interests, and if they fail to do so, they will likely be replaced. So we can see that these power structures act fairly ubiquitously, excluding the odd democratic cooperative, across society regardless of the views of those in charge. Now if we assume power purely comes through agents, this must lead us to think that these people are simply disingenuous when they say that they'd actually like to help, which may be true in many cases. But then we also see how many of their actions can simply be viewed as the result of societal forces. For example, the link between the oil industry and the military was especially apparent during the Iraq war. And of course the links between capital and politics are always apparent, but became particularly blatant during the 2008 financial crisis. So to explain the ubiquity of these practices through so many public spaces and institutions, you need a bigger structure than just the individual. When people think of power as solely produced by human agents, trying to fill the gaps in this bigger structure can lead you somewhat astray, and it's easy to see why. To explain these repeated coercive behaviours and their coherence in this way, there is a temptation to, effectively, add more agents. It's easy to think of power emanating from a single person or small group. So we get ideas like the Masons, the Illuminati, the New World Order, paedophile rings in pizza shops, postmodern cultural Marxism, ancient cults, alien visitors, Jewish conspiracies, and so on, to fill in the gaps with ever more powerful agents who exert secret and malicious control over society. These conspiracy theories are obviously bollocks and often serve to prop up some horrific right-wing ideas, especially anti-Semitism. It is amazing how, when you scratch the surface, even the most banal-seeming conspiracy theories seem, when you delve deep enough, to end up at something something for the Jews. But I would suggest some of the appeal of these ideas does come from this naive way of looking at power as operating through human agents, rather than understanding how human agents, even in high positions of power, are often guided and dominated by systems beyond their control. So, I've spent a while there outlining the problems of a purely agent-based notion of power. So what is my point here? What's the alternative to a view of power enacted through agents? Well, of course, we've explored here how Marx highlights how fundamental economic structures of society create interest groups. But I want to go a bit further still, out along this yellow brick road, to look even closer behind the curtain. And this brings us to one of my favourite philosophers, though that's not to say I agree with everything he said, that's right, it's time for some Foucault. Part 2. Foucault. So, as you might have guessed by now, Foucault does say it is a mistake to think of power enacted merely or wholly through agents. 
and claims that the philosophy of power to date has continued to make a key error in understanding how power has changed in the modern world. At the bottom, despite the differences in epochs and objectives, the representation of power has remained under the spell of monarchy. In political thought and analysis, we still have not cut the head off the king. Now, of course, Foucault is French, and they did actually cut the head off their king. Well, so did the British, but we weren't so good at sticking to the decision, it seems. So here he's clearly not discussing the actual decapitation of monarchs. What he means is that we still see power as a function that emanates down from a single top point, and exercised by a ruler who has agency to do as they like, and that this is a hangover from monarchic systems and sovereign forms of power that faded out largely in the 18th century. In terms of our Oz analogy before, he's claiming that when we pull back the curtain, what we imagine we see is a king, or a person or group who embody the role of the king. But, as Foucault argues, this is not what is really there. Power is not something that is acquired, seized, or shared, something that one holds onto or allows to slip away. Power is exercised from innumerable points in the interplay of non-egalitarian and mobile relations. Here we see the analysis we made above, that power is not held by individual agents, but embodied by forces that influence them. But we can already see a difference from the Marxist outline we looked at before. For Foucault, power is not simply exerted by the grand societal force of, in the contemporary era, capitalism. It is not simply a function of the mode of production. Power is exerted from innumerable points which have an interplay of relations, and here we see, regardless of what any half-baked lobster obsessive has to say about it, one of the core points of divergence between Foucault and Marx. For Marx, power is enacted through the relationship between a cultural superstructure and an economic base. For Foucault, this relationship is much more complex. By power, I do not mean power as a group of institutions and mechanisms that secure the subservience of the citizens of a given state. I do not mean either a mode of subjugation in which, in contrast to violence, has the form of rule. The analysis made in terms of power must not assume that the sovereignty of the state, the form of law, or the overall unity of a dominion are given at the outset. There are only the terminal forms power takes. It seems to me power must be understood as the multiplicity of force relations imminent in the sphere in which they operate and which constitute their own organization. Power is everywhere, not because it embraces everything, but because it is produced from one moment to the next, at every point, or rather in every relation from one point to the other. So for Foucault, we see that power is not a sweeping downward of a single unified system of control, but emanates outwards from a series of direct social relations. In this way, every interaction produces its own power, which may well align with a dominant mode. But that is less because the dominant mode dictates the relations of power, but because it is emergent from relations of power at every point. We should note here that not only is Foucault not talking about power in a classical Marxist sense, he's also not talking about power in the classical anarchist sense, where power is often perceived as purely negative, concerned with hierarchy and domination. However, Foucault sees power as a force present in all social relations which can be both productive and repressive. And this is not to say that productive and repressive correlate to good or bad in Foucault's thought. Either one can be positive or negative. For example, power may repress sexual expression, something most of us would see as negative. But, say, limiting the power of transnational corporations to exploit workers would also be a repressive use of power, but one which we may see as positive. In the same way, calling power productive, for Foucault, merely means that it produces or makes something, something which may be good or bad. For example, in my video on the white working class, I showed how, for Foucault, Power within the prison system and court system produces the figure of the delinquent, which we may well see as negative, but power also produces in positive ways. For example, even a truly egalitarian society would, for Foucault, produce individuals through power, though these may be of a more positive sort. Individuals adapted to cooperation, for example, rather than the coercive sorts of individuals, often produced by capitalist interpersonal relations, of competition and personal gain. For Foucault, the individual is always produced by power. It's just a matter of how the powers that produce individuals function. So, 
If Foucault doesn't see the core underlying force defining how power relations occur at the level of the individual, in line with the classic view of agency, nor at the level of economic production, as the Marxist would have it, where does he see this produced? Well, primarily, Foucault situates the base of power relations at the level of knowledge. In much of his early work, such as The Birth of the Clinic and Madness and Civilization, and in his later period in Discipline and Punish, he looks at how different institutions, such as the hospital, the asylum and prison, that emerged around the French Revolution, grew out of new forms of knowledge that had become dominant. The possibility of scientific measurement allowing for the control of new forces, emerging from events such as the Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution and even the French Revolution, allowed for discourses to emerge which created the need for these institutions to carry out their work. These emergent discourses, such as biology, psychology and even general grammar, among other things, how they produced these sorts of effects, and how they differed from previous modes of thought, are examined by Foucault in his book The Order of Things. What we see across these works of Foucault's is how the change in how, for example, individuals were viewed allowed for a change in how power acted on them. In the case of the individual, the search for invisible forces after, for example, the emergence of the Newtonian ideal can be said to have produced a space for the examination of unseen forces in the acts of the individual. This allowed the rise of a discourse to study these forces, psychology, as well as ways of addressing perceived deviances through the clinically inflected practices of the asylum and the prison and even the hospital. These emergences for Foucault are not dictated from above by a power with a conspiratorial plan, but emerge from various points below as different ideas and projects within the new framework find commonality and coalesce into new sorts of power relations. And, even if they come to be enforced from above, they often continue to act from below as well, and may do so in a way not directly dependent on the strength of the power from above. Once people are used to a certain set of power relations, they will discipline themselves to an extent. An account that serves as a great example of this was laid out by Rowan Ellis in her recent video on the history of homophobia in schools where she describes how Section 28, a rule in UK law that for many years forbade um, promoting homosexuality in schools, was damaging to young LGBT people at the time. It's a great video and you should go check it out. But what is relevant here is that, as she points out, once Section 28 was lifted, that is to say, once the force of power from above had been removed in the early 2000s, Many UK schools and teachers still did not know how to deal with LGBT plus issues in schools, the knowledge having been forbidden for decades, and so generally defaulted to the behaviour they were used to, playing safe, not pushing the boat out, and trying to compromise between LGBT rights and conservative bigotries, remaining unsure if it was even safe to allow school computers to access the Stonewall website and so on, for fear of gay and lesbian content. In this way, we see how power acts from below, and can do so even without an imperative from above. We can see this in one way as a reversal of the Marxist conception, where power emerges from the mode of production, conditions society, and in that way creates the individuals needed to fill it through repressive and coercive means. However, we can also see that mode of power active in a Foucauldian system, but this works in concert with the actions of power at various levels, creating an interrelated feedback loop. There is no power that is operated without aims and objectives, but this does not mean that it results from the choice or decision of an individual subject. Let us not look for the headquarters that presides over its rationality. The rationality of power is characterized by tactics which are often quite explicit at the restrictive level where they are inscribed. Tactics which, becoming connected to one another, attracting and propagating one another, but finding their base of support and condition elsewhere, and by forming comprehensive systems. The logic is perfectly clear, the aims are decipherable, and yet it is often the case that no one can be said to have invented them. So, contrary to the Marxist claim, here, power is not merely a force created by the relation of social superstructure to the productive base, but more of a piecemeal system which arranges emergent ideas to its benefit, as smaller acts of power are brought together by social interactions to form coherent and logical systems based thereon. But these systems are not designed. They are the result of a series of power relations coming together to form a coherent whole, an act which involves a mix of multiple agents and multiple power relations. In this way, I also feel although Foucault's analysis of power does contradict some of the normal approaches to the topic from classical anarchism, 
it is also somewhat easily assimilated into an anarchist idea of power. While we can still oppose hierarchy and oppression, it allows us to analyse and oppose that at a more local level, as well as at the levels of state and capital. And the idea that power is exerted from below at all points at once also marries rather well with the anarchist preference for diffuse democratic power from below, and may even offer some analysis on how to ensure that micro-power relations that maintain an anarchist system remain as egalitarian as practically possible, helping us analyse how best to restructure society to allow more people to have an input to the formative process of power relations, thereby engendering a more distributed, egalitarian set of interactions. Foucault himself certainly seemed to associate the period in which the bourgeois were gaining political power with an intensification of the effects of power relations at smaller and smaller levels in the population, particularly at the level of the body and of life itself, although he doesn't always mention the bourgeois in so many words. But he tells us how, over the course of the change of power structure from the sovereign model of church and kings, to the bourgeois scientific and industrial models emerging in the 18th and 19th centuries, for the first time in history, biological existence was reflected in political existence. The fact of living was no longer an inaccessible substrate that only emerged from time to time, amid the randomness of death and its fatality. Part of it passed into knowledge's field of control and power's fear of intervention. Power would no longer be dealing simply with legal subjects over whom the ultimate dominion was death, but with living beings and the mastery it would be able to exercise over them would have to be applied at the level of life itself. It was the taking charge of life more than the threat of death that gave power its access to even the body. He calls this operation of power at the level of life and the body biopower. If one can apply the term biohistory to the pressures through which the movements of life and the processes of history interfere with one another, one would have to speak of biopower to designate what brought life and its mechanisms into the realm of explicit calculations and made knowledge power an agent of the transformation of human life. In this way, Foucault sees the transition into industrial bourgeois societies as one which expands the operation of power vastly, as the new sciences, having already begun to discipline the physical world to their needs, became applied to the study of body and mind, and thus, inevitably, to the formation of methods to guide and control these faculties. We can see examples to illustrate this in how the prison moved punishment from an occasional ecstatic process like the execution under sovereign power to an ongoing process of bodily discipline and psychological assessment which birthed in the prison and the other core disciplinary spaces like the factory, workhouse, hospital and asylum but then expanded as disciplinary techniques to condition the new workers of the factories and mills and so on were demanded by these new growing institutions. Or in the case of Freudian psychology, how this knowledge was quickly picked up by the likes of his nephew, Edward Bernays, to revolutionise advertising, bringing the assertion of psychological pressure to your newspapers and TV screens. Foucault saw this biopower and biopolitics as creating a disciplinary society, where the controlling authoritarian systems of the prison and the factory expanded out to discipline populations in ever-increasing fields of their lives. Schools conditioned children for the factory, for work, and if they become unsound in some way, the asylum or prison aim to patch over the problem by enforcing more strictly the societal discipline, and so on. He refers to these as technologies of power, specifically disciplinary technologies, often using surveillance as an example. But I covered that bit in part two of my Dark Side of Liberalism series, so you can go watch it there if you want to find out about that. These technologies often grew up separately, or through horizontal connections, in Foucault's view. Not as some conspiracy or design, but it was through their coherence with each other, and with emerging capitalist production, which saw these methods as useful for maximising the output of its human workforce, that they became norms of social organisation. Now, dark as this may already sound, Foucault maps out some of the even more chilling underside of this application of power to life. There has been a parallel shift in the right of death, or at least a tendency to align itself with the existences of life administering power and to define itself accordingly. This death that was based on the rights of the sovereign is now manifested as simply the reverse of the right of the social body to ensure, maintain, or develop its life. Yet wars were never so bloody as they have been since the 19th century. 
and all things being equal, never before did regimes visit such holocaust onto their own populations. It is as managers of life and survival, and of bodies of the race, that so many regimes have been able to wage so many wars, causing so many men to be killed. The principle underlying the tactics of battle, that one has to be capable of killing in order to go on living, has become the principle that defines states. But the existence in question is no longer the jurisdictional existence of sovereignty. At stake is the biological existence of the population. If genocide is indeed the dream of modern powers, this is not because of a recent return to the ancient right to kill. It's because power is situated and exercised at the level of life, the species, the race, and the larger scale phenomena of the population. We see here, in the very technologies that the state used to try and order and make useful the lives of those subject to its power, they also found new ways to remove the right to life. Again, he sees this as emergent from a particular interaction of power and knowledge. We can understand, first of all, the link that was made quickly, I almost said immediately, established between 19th century biological theory. Basically, evolutionism, understood in the broad sense, or in other words, not so much Darwin's theory itself as a set, a bundle of notions, naturally became, within a few years, not simply a way of transcribing political discourse into biological terms, and not simply a way of dressing up political discourse in scientific clothing, but a real way of thinking about the relation between colonization, the necessity for wars, criminality, the phenomena of madness and mental illness, the history of societies with their different classes, and so on. Racism first develops with colonialization, or in other words, with colonizing genocide. If you are functioning in a biopower mode, how can you justify the need to kill people, to kill populations, and to kill civilizations? By using themes of evolutionism, by appealing to racism. So we see, for Foucault, racism is not just a peripheral issue to economics, but a fundamental aspect of how power operates in the states that grew up in the wake of sovereign monarchic power. That is to say, liberal states. And in fact, in Foucault's view, forms a key basis for the right to exert lethal force, and the monopoly of such violence, by these liberal states. Here we see one of the benefits of applying Foucauldian notions of power, for unlike Marxists, who relate racism to the superstructure, a result of the base, Foucault situates racism in the very knowledge base that generates the power relations of the liberal state. It has its own co-emergent base in the relations of knowledge which inflect those of power. The ongoing practice of skull-measuring snake oil salesmen has embedded itself in our political reality. And we do still see this today in how many conservatives and capitalists still use some form of social Darwinist argument to uphold the system, attributing the success of the rich to their natural qualities, and, by comparison, the poverty of the workers to their failure. If you want my critique of social Darwinism, by the way, that's also in episode 2 of my Dark Side of Liberalism series. So we can see where all this is going. For Foucault, the peak of this doctrine, the ultimate society of disciplinary power over life, is expressed in, well, the obvious place. No state could have more disciplinary power than the Nazi regime, nor was there any other state in which the biological was so tightly, so insistently regulated. Disciplinary power and biopower, all this permeated, underpinned Nazi society, controlling the random element inherent in biological processes was one of the regime's immediate objectives. Ultimately, everybody in the Nazi state had power of life and death over his or her neighbors, if only because the practice of informing, which effectively means doing away with the people next door, or having them done away with. So murderous power was unleashed throughout the entire social body. Part 3. Preliminary Thoughts on Foucault, Marx, and Class Analysis At this point, I do want to bring in some of my own thoughts. As up to now in this explanation, I've merely tried to represent Foucault's view as faithfully as I can, apart from that little aside relating it to anarchist power. However, from this point on, I'm going to start using Foucault's thought to make more of a point. So, while I'm still trying to keep a relatively consistent use of Foucault, I am going to increasingly bring in some of my own takes, 
and some references from other thinkers to make a wider argument, so be warned, especially if you're brushing up for a philosophy paper on Foucault or something. Particularly right now, I'd like to look more closely at this relationship between Foucault and Marx. Foucault was from a Marxist background, and Marx and Nietzsche are often listed as his greatest influences, but he did reject Marxism as a strict theoretical framework, although his work still engages with the attempt to understand and improve society, and his loyalties were generally against the status quo, as shown by his participation in the May 68 Paris occupations, and his work also always maintained a revolutionary aspect, with parallels to Marx, even if not strictly Marxist. For myself, as a lover of Foucault, Marx, and anarchism, I would see these differing analyses as more of a toolbox from which to draw, an idea popular in other of Foucault's contemporaries, such as Deleuze, as, in their own areas, Marxist and Foucauldian power analytics can both reveal useful things. As such, going forward, I'm going to mix Foucault with a bit more of a Marxist approach and class analysis. This is ontologically, that is to say, in terms of the implicit worldviews of the philosophies, an uneasy marriage of modernist and postmodern concepts, which, no matter what the lobster man tells you, do not actually meld that easily at a deeper level. But I think it is one which is theoretically justifiable. Class analysis still seems to me to be imminently present in much of Foucault's work, if just below the surface. I mean, the change he repeatedly draws on for his work, the move from sovereign to disciplinary power, is itself directly historically associated with the rise of the bourgeois. And certainly, Marxist or not, to my knowledge he remained critical of capitalism and authority throughout his career, although let's not talk about that time he supported the Iranian Revolution, but I may expand on all this in a future essay, as a full ontological justification for this fusion may need a lot more work and certainly be more than I can do in this video. However, I think it is apparent that the use of these two together can be very practically useful. So for now, I will justify my combination only on this basis of practicality. For example, if we look at something like institutional racism in our society, we can see both the Marxist force, economic dominance over non-European groups which allowed them to be objects of slaughter or sale, and the Foucauldian force that we just explored, the emergence of new systems of classification which allowed for a new categorical notion of ethnic separation through the various discourses such as race science, phrenology, eugenics, and social Darwinism, all of which, incidentally, turned out to be complete bullshit. Also through Foucault, we can see how this race science could emerge from below to engender the society, and how it is continually supported and reinforced through continual micro-acts of power relations at the interpersonal level and lower institutional levels, and how this can both cause and be caused by the emanation of racist power structures from above to secure cheap labour for the economic system in the Marxist sense. Thus, by using these two perspectives in tandem, we can see both the economic and conceptual underpinnings of racial oppression, and how it manifests in our society. In this way, I feel effectively dual-wielding these philosophies may need some work to make it philosophically coherent, but the two perspectives can together illuminate issues from differing directions, giving a fuller picture of both the problems and the solutions. That, and also I'm clearly just an unrepentant postmodern cultural Marxist. From another side, we can see that Foucault's claim here does not in fact preclude, in my view, a class analysis similar to that of Marx, although it does require modifications to the theoretical framework. In Foucauldian terms, we can still understand that a certain class of individuals, currently the bourgeois, through their levels of social influence and the preference of existing power relations for them, may have a much greater chance of their behaviours and power acts being amalgamated into the wider field of power, so we can still see that their influence robs the proletariat of its fair share of power relations, and thus preserve at least a useful analogue to Marxist class analysis. Part 4. It's the system, man. So, that is pretty well all the exposition I want to do on Foucault, and it's been quite a lot, so perhaps you're now wondering, why am I telling you all this? Well, you could think I just want to educate you about these ideas of Foucault's, and I do. Education is good for its own sake, but on this channel I do tend to try and bring things around to their social implications today. As for me, that's basically the point of doing philosophy. So what is my purpose in talking about Foucault now? What relevance do I feel this has for us today? Well, I am going to answer that question, but before I get onto this, there is one more point to consider in using Foucault to approach contemporary society, and that is not a point from Foucault, but one made to expand on his work after his death by Gilles Deleuze, 
a philosopher who, with Foucault, was also lumped into the post-structuralist category of philosophers. I'm not going to explain what that term means here, you can look it up if you want details, but it can be complicated to express and isn't too relevant to lay out here, but the point is they were in the same school of thought, were contemporaries, and also they both took part in the May 68 Paris demonstrations together. Deleuze recognised that the mode of expression of biopower in modern societies was shifting away from the disciplinary model described by Foucault to a new form, which he described as societies of control. Foucault located the disciplinary societies in the 18th and 19th centuries. They reached their height at the outset of the 20th. They initiate the organization of vast spaces of enclosure. Foucault has brilliantly analyzed the ideal project of these environments of enclosure. But in their turn, the disciplines underwent a crisis to the benefit of new forces that were gradually instituted and which accelerated after World War II. A disciplinary society was what we already no longer were, what we had ceased to be. We are in a generalized crisis in relation to all the environments of enclosure, prison, hospital, factory, school, family. Everyone knows that these institutions are finished, whatever the length of their expiration periods. It's only a matter of administering their last rites and of keeping people employed until the installation of the new forces knocking at the door. These are the societies of control which are in the process of replacing the disciplinary societies. In societies of control, we are not regimented through life as per the disciplinary society, but incentivized, induced, and managed. Education subsides in favor of perpetual training as we move from one short-lived workplace to the next. Work and home life merge, and surveillance is in part replaced with perpetual self-monitoring, seeking individual targets and objectives, and the channeling of attention and actions through ever more complicated computer algorithms, such as those that may have brought you to this video on YouTube. Doesn't participating in control society feel good? This does not necessarily mean a change in the motive or intentions of the power at work, but in its mode of operation and the figures it produces. As Mark Fisher puts it in his book Capitalist Realism, If the figure of discipline was the worker prisoner, the figure of control is the debtor addict. Cyberspatial capital operates by addicting its users. I think this transformation in the mode of power is important to note, and certainly Fisher's take on the societies of control has a lot that could be unpacked, but I may well cover that elsewhere soon. Also, we cannot understand this conversion as complete, as certainly there are still disciplinary frameworks at play in our society, but post-disciplinary societies have presented new forms and ways in which power relations can express and spread themselves. So power still operates in this diffuse way Foucault noted, perhaps even more so, as we are increasingly pushed to police and control ourselves. And this is often combined with a happier, more appealing seeming aesthetic, portrayed as liberations. Offices offer us open plan environments, so we can be more sociable at work. Algorithms offer us links to products based on our interests, customizing our online experience. And of course, games offer us player choice to, uh, uh, get good by spending money. But, you know, it sounds nice. But on the other side, we can see these as means to increase subtle surveillance in more areas of life, to gain more coercive power by observing your behaviour, and to use this power to encourage you to buy things, be it from an internet advert, or the in-game economies of many computer games today. The underlying tendencies at work here, however, are still the same, and nowhere is this more clear than in the current resurgence of far-right and fascistic beliefs which, at their core, are still based on these same tendencies of thought, this politicization of biology and the body that Foucault discussed. However, the way of expressing it has changed. It's now less common for fascists and far-right activists to promote themselves by demonstrations of their disciplinary powers in marches, military formations, and regimented hierarchical organizations. Instead, they're growing up at the points where control acts strongest. That is to say, in the nodes that attract addiction-prone and isolated individuals engaged with the internet. Websites like YouTube and Facebook already work on how to make their services more addictive. This isn't an anti-social media point, or a what if phones but too much argument, but an acknowledgement that these power plays exist on the internet just as they do in other areas like mainstream media, gambling, and even food production. The right have been quick to begin operating at these new points of power and to adopt these new systems and approaches, using dating coaching, life advice, and cultural criticism as ways of endearing themselves to their audience, playing on the insecurities of our more atomized culture in order to smuggle their dark politics and race science into the discourse. 
and by this method to avoid the moral revulsion that many may feel, rightly, to these ideas. And as we see, they've had some success at doing this, as their language and narratives have been able to move increasingly into the right-wing mainstream, where we see politicians of right-wing parties increasingly making points popularised by the online right in mainstream media. Of course, things like Fox News and Trump are obvious examples, but even here in the UK we have had mainstream newspapers like The Telegraph and Times talk about snowflakes and other such far-right talking points, and even mainstream conservative politicians repeating them. Um, James, the Muslim Council of Britain is calling on the Conservative Party to adopt the same definition of Islamophobia that a cross-party group of MPs want you to adopt. Why won't you? Um, there are, I mean, there, there, there is no agreed uh, definition of Islamophobia. There's no internationally agreed definition uh, of Islamophobia. There of, is a uh, definition. Let's have a look at the all-party parliamentary group definition um, on British Muslims that says Islamophobia is rooted in racism and is a type of racism that targets expressions of Muslimness or perceived Muslimness. Muslimness. Why won't you accept it? Oh, well, that's, uh, there are, uh, I, I personally have had uh, contradictory messages uh, from um, uh, Muslims, both within the Conservative Party and outside the Conservative Party. For, okay. for example, some of the connectations, uh, uh, connecting uh, uh, race as the definition when people say that uh, being a Muslim is not a race, it is a religion. That's that is an not, and that is not, right and that is not, and that is not dependent on the right, definition. The far right consistently say it's not racist if you're, you know, if you're Islamophobic because Islam isn't a race. Look, the consequences. But I've also had that from no, Muslims. No, I've, the I've consequences of Islamophobia are rooted in racism. Islamophobia is a racism. Uh, you know, the idea that it be, is, isn't because of ethnicity. There are loads of Sikh people that get Islamophobia because of people in people's minds. You know, they're very, very confused about um, symbols of, of religions. The idea that you couldn't accept this is nonsensical, but it is symbolic of the racism that is endemic within your party. With Foucault's analysis of power, we can see how these talking points, these powerful knowledges, which is not to say that they are true, but they are potential objects of knowledge in that people believe them, can, despite being generated from below, be quickly incorporated into the major systems of power like the state and capital. And the re-emergence of these ideas in the mainstream and their transition further up the scale of power shows the clear risk that the peak of control societies, like that of disciplinary ones in the Nazis, could itself be an incredibly bloody experience that may similarly scar the world. We should certainly aim not to let it reach that point before we learn this lesson though. Here, Foucault shows us the immense power of ideas and the immense threat that they can hold. In reality, we have recently had examples of just how dangerous ideas can be when a far-right shooter took the lives of 50 people in mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand. The shooter's manifesto showed a litany of influences from across the far-right, whose ideas had contributed to his actions, leading to many discussions of the notion of stochastic terrorism, which American Johnson did a great video about for his channel Non-Compete. This is well worth a watch if you haven't seen it. Stochastic terrorism is defined on Wiktionary as the use of mass public communication, usually against a particular individual or group, which incites or inspires acts of terrorism, which are statistically probable, but happen seemingly at random. So stochastic terrorism, viewed through this lens, can be seen as the weaponizing of the very power relations of knowledge Foucault discusses, spreading ideas which are likely to cause violence, and willing that violence, while keeping a level of remove that keeps your hands clean. Intention is of course a hard thing to judge, but it's not hard to see that many of today's right-wing figures, on YouTube and elsewhere, do spread ideas likely to cause violence or terrorism. And if any of them intend those results, which is hard to prove individually, but also which we must assume some of them do, because they can't all be blind to the consequences of their actions, they are aiding in this spread. However, with Foucault, we also know that they do not have to intend this. They are simply part of the process of forming these positions, and their position is one which is likely to form anyway, and be replaced in our current system of power. Not only this, but far-right views are far more likely to be assimilated into our current system. So let's go on to look at why that is. Foucault shows us throughout his work how, with the political realisation of the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution, effectively the liberal bourgeois state, is bound up with systems that seek to take power over the very bodies and even thoughts of the people within them. To surveil and police their actions, their intentions, their health and even their reproduction and sexuality, and their very makeup as a population, even at times to the level of their political ideas or their race and that this reached its logical conclusion in the massacres of ethnic and social others and political opponents by regimes like the Nazis. In essence, we see that the bourgeois state, in its very structure, has a tendency to favour not necessarily Nazism or fascism exactly, but Nazi and fascist style policies, authoritarian practices, totalitarian surveillance, political suppression, eugenics, and of course genocide. 
This is not to say that all liberal societies practice all of these things. Although, historically, the modern global capitalist economy promoted by liberal states is built on all of these things. But, contrary to many popular beliefs that try and alienate fascism as something wildly foreign to our liberal democracies, they in fact contain deep-rooted seeds embedded in its very ways of knowing which create and are created and strengthened by forces within it, be they police forces, authoritarian politicians, bankers and businessmen, generals or far-right demagogues on YouTube. And that means there is always imminent risk that these forces may quickly overtake the liberal structure they exist within. I talked about this in depth from a more Marxist approach in my five-part Dark Side of Liberalism series, especially parts four and five, where I show the tendencies created by the dominant economic side of liberalism, its economic side being capitalism, not only undermine the social side many associate with liberalism, but also, again, contains within it many of the seeds and tools which allow fascism to take root. I think that series very much complements this conclusion. I think this also reinforces the practical reason I gave before for using both Marxist and Foucauldian tools, despite their ontological differences, as they can give us different views of the same problem, showing more ways in which it can be understood and, of course, countered. Whatever you want to call it, fascism, Nazism, tyranny, totalitarianism, many functions of our society are built in such a way that they are easily appropriated and used to advance these sorts of disastrous politics. Now this is all very doom and gloom, and it should be. The inherent threat of fascism in the very structures and ideas of our state should be a cause for severe concern even if we weren't living in a time like today, when the rise of literal neo-fascist forces is presenting itself as a deep and immediate threat. However, this video is not just about grim realities, because I think there are also some very positive implications that we can draw from Foucault's analysis of power as I've looked at it here. The first and most obvious is that any theory of oppressive power has a direct reverse. That is to say, as Foucault puts it, Where there is power, there is resistance. And this analysis, as well as highlighting effective points at which the right use power, also highlights effective points we can use it too. We can also engage in these media platforms, in the spaces where addiction and atomization have left many in our control societies, often including ourselves and myself. This is not to lord it over anyone, we are literally all in this together. And we can reach out to help them heal, not by blaming the other, as in the politics of the right, but in seeing how the very functioning of our system regardless of the agency of those at the top, serves to make all our lives worse. Resistances, Foucault tells us, are always individual and never completely outside of power, but he also tells us that power relations can move and be adopted horizontally and come together with those that fit them to make new systems, just as happened in all the previous transition points, be it sovereign to disciplinary power or disciplinary to control. And control power actually offers us many opportunities as socialists to imagine new realms of power, as many of its surface aesthetics, as with those of liberalism, do marry to our principles. Equality, openness, sharing, even fun. Of course, these are operated cynically, but they do also offer openings for us to demonstrate how a truly egalitarian society would better serve these surface ideals, which in our current system merely hide the same old mechanisms of power over the body. And in that way, hopefully, we can build more egalitarian power relations between people. And people may go out and organise around those relations, setting up new models of shared power which may come to inflect or replace our current system. This is a difficult task, and as we saw in the analysis before, the odds are not necessarily always in our favour, and the stakes are high. So yeah, educate, agitate and organise everyone, let's get this system changed. And also, save the planet from climate change too, that's really important. But can Foucault give us any clues as to what that society should be like? Well, in one way, not many, and certainly he was not into prefiguring institutions of a post-revolutionary society, but he did try and identify power relations that may need to be addressed by those forming such societies. There's a great example of him doing this in practice in a debate he had with some Maoists on the formation of post-revolutionary courts, a transcript of which is printed in a book of his selected interviews and writings titled Power Knowledge but this essay is already long enough, so you can go read that for yourselves if you want. On this note, I want to return to the first quote I took from Foucault, back at the start of this essay. In political thought and analysis, we still have not cut the head off the king. 
Now this, of course, means we still think about our current power relations as though they are monarchical, and that we would understand them better in another way, as we said above. But I also think there is something we can take from this in terms of how to progress our societies. We need to cut the head off the king, not just in our analysis of the present, but also in our ideas for the future. Now to be clear, this is not an incitation to regicide, political assassination, or any sort of actual physical decapitation of people. That would be very messy, and anyway, if you cut the head off the king, another one will come Hydra-like to take its place. No, we need to decapitate the system of power. We need to imagine a society in which power relations are not designed in such a way as to presume or leave a placeholder for a king or an absolute ruler. This is not to say we literally kill anyone, but that we remove the points of authority that would give them power to oppress others, be it through the excesses of political power, executive power in the workplace, or economic power through accumulation of capital. Even in a socialist project, the dangers of these positions, these kings in the inherent power structures, can be very profound. And I think an examination of the way this authoritarian and hierarchical form operated in the Soviet Union and similar 20th century experiments in authoritarian communism show the dangers of reproducing this structure from our current society into the next one. This is one of the reasons that I identify far more strongly with the libertarian communist and anarchist traditions myself. Even if we overthrow capital, if we recreate these systems of authority we have inherited all the way back to monarchical power, we will always set up another sovereign authority, with its own tendencies to oppression and control, but with a different inflection, and it will take yet another revolution to bring such a system down. When we look behind the curtain, we think we see someone. We imagine a king. But in fact, there is nothing there. Only the ever smaller structures of the machine still working to produce its spectacle of lights. And we need to change the machine, to make it work for us, to stop it from coercing us and imposing its systems at our expense. But in doing so, we must not reimagine the man behind the curtain, or place a new one there. Or think we can end the harm done by our system merely by changing the personnel, or creating new executives, new kings and wizards, to sit behind the curtain. We must embrace the emptiness of the operator's booth, and find a way to live together in light of its absence, recognising power does not work to the design of some agent, some all-powerful wizard, but also that we can all be agents within it. Yes, there are people who directly and maliciously use their power, and we should certainly hold them responsible to an extent. I'm not arguing that powerful elites are just victims too, or something like that. But if we focus only on that, we can miss that replacing the people without changing the system, simply plugging people we think are nicer into the machine, will simply produce the same tyrannies or systems of exploitation, though perhaps with some different trimmings. Foucault tells us power is everywhere. It is a force between everything. It's the system, man. And it always will be. So if we want to change the problems of our society, we must change the system. But we often talk of it as something people do to us. And again, this is a useful shorthand, but we must be aware of this breakdown, this underlying atomic nature of power, in order that we can best analyse our society, and so that we can see what a positive set of power relations may be, making a system where there is no they to be doing this to us. A society where we are free to join in mutual social expressions, to help each other and the planet, radically transforming the operation of power in our societies and thereby avoiding repeating the mistakes of our current society as we move to the next. Nietzsche, a great influence on Foucault, was seen to prophesize the death of God. Actually, Stirner did it first, but it doesn't really matter here. And he demanded a transvaluation of society to deal with this death of God. Now, I don't agree with how Nietzsche goes about this, and we'll cover that another time. But I think that, seeing Foucault in this light, we can see Foucault as similarly heralding the death of the king, of the executive agent of power, obviously, again, in the conceptual sense. And this too demands a huge transvaluation of society. It is in moving away from oppressive and unjustified hierarchies, be they economic or political, that I think we can make the best future from this point. But it is a future that is contested. As we noted above, many on the right are also trying to deeply influence how new values are formed asking us not to join as a human community, but by ties of race and exclusions to the other, and indeed often seeking a way to put their own man behind the curtain, or to adjust the machine to make its harm so much greater, and reinvigorate its power over life and death, even to the point of genocide. 
Right now, with the rise of the right, this choice couldn't be clearer, and the stakes have never been so high. But we are not on a one-way track to tyranny. We are at a fork in our yellow brick road, and it won't be easy, but we do still have a chance to choose the best path, so that, when we reach our Emerald City, we will do it ready to cut the head off the king, and build a new world with no gods, no masters, and no wizards. And maybe, somewhere down that yellow brick road, we can create a world where people can be free, equal, and happy. Somewhere. 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 Somewhere over the rainbow, way up high, there's a land that I heard of once in a lullaby. Somewhere over the rainbow, skies are blue. that you dare to dream really do come true Someday I'll wish upon a star and wake up where the clouds are far behind me Where troubles melt like lemon drops away above the chimney tops That's where you'll find me So thanks for listening everyone this video took quite a lot of research, and combined with the fact that I was starting a new job, and with the loss of a great friend and comrade, it has taken a lot longer to get out than I had hoped. So I'm sorry for that, and I'll try and get two videos out in a month sometime soon to make up for it. Also, I want to mention that since starting this video, I've actually become a lot more critical of Foucault than I was before. I think this video still stands up, and I've left it very Foucault positive, in order to give Foucault a fair hearing, and because the ideas here are ones that I have believed for a very long time, but I also might do some more critical work on Foucault sometime in the near future. And by that, I don't just mean that he never mentions women in his writing, although that is a thing. And with that said, I'd like to thank all the lovely people who helped out on this video. Baphometrics for providing the music, Radiant 2 Pie, Chrisiosity, and Radical Reviewer for providing voices, my fellow actors for taking part in the sketch, Ralph and Blue Leaf Studios for helping me with this rather indulgent outro you're listening to, my dad for playing the piano for this outro, and of course, Blue the Gender for the original graphics and animations. And of course, I'd like to thank my patrons who've put up with the lateness of this video. Their names are scrolling past now. I love you guys, you're all amazing. With extra special thanks going to George Soros and Peter Benzoni. And of course, I'd like to thank my new patrons since the last video, Revelo, James Dirtke, and Ethan Harris. And if you'd like to help support the video and join that list of names, then you can pledge me some money on Patreon, the link's in the description. Or if you can't commit to the monthly payments of Patreon, you can also now make a one-time donation on Coffee.com. The link again is in the description. So that's about all I've got time to say here. Bye. Somewhere over the rainbow, bluebirds fly. Birds fly over the rainbow. Why then, oh why can't I? If happy little bluebirds fly beyond the rainbow.